Imagine that Facebook went dark tonight, forever. More than a billion user accounts and several billion user entries would be suddenly inaccessible. But they wouldn't necessarily be gone forever. They might live on. In fact, it's highly likely they would live on. Or maybe some fragment of them would live on in remote, formerly active Facebook servers scattered around the country and even around the world. Well, that's not unlike what happened uh, a little more than a decade ago when Yahoo shut down GeoCities, which it had acquired in 1999. GeoCities was a landmark social community. It had 38 million pages. At the time of its acquisition, GeoCities was the web's third most active website. Tonight, we explore two facets of the GeoCities story. The first, which is our lobby exhibition, The Deleted City, is a fascinating look at what can happen in the digital dark age when something like GeoCities ceases to fu function, but the underlying data is still there and becomes a kind of poetic form of digital art. And then we will have an insightful conversation with GeoCities co-founder, David Bennett. David's vision and determination on many levels led to the creation of this unique digital neighborhood and a great business. And in the years after GeoCities, he's become one of the country's leading tech and social entrepreneurs and philanthropists through the David Bennett Foundation. First, the deleted city. So we learned as we were curating this exhibit that the challenge of presenting the deleted city is framing it so that visitors could understand the boundaries between the art piece on the one hand and the original GeoCities website that it's based on. Our networking and mobile and web curator, Mark Weber, and Kirsten Tashev, who heads all of our exhibition work here, added a number of historical images and text panels around the installation, as you'll see, to give it some context. There were three themes, and you'll hear from, uh, from the artist tonight, Richard Vigen, about them. One was the rise and fall of GeoCities and its rescue, or its partial rescue, the use of rescued archives for this work of art, and the general problem of this thing I called a minute ago, the digital dark age. It's a great introduction to this long-term examination that we're now undertaking as an institution on the history and importance of software, its impact on society, and the implications for software and code in the future. And once again, I want to say a big thank you to the Internet Archive, uh, who has been so instrumental, not simply in this particular work, but in doing so much work to make sure that uh, what's happening on the Internet, or at least some of it, is around for future generations to marvel at. You're going to see some things in Richard's presentation tonight that are going to really take you back. The artist, Richard Vigen, is a designer based in Arnhem, the Netherlands whose studio for contemporary information culture investigates new strategies to find big stories and big data through research and design. Richard makes interactive data visualizations, which is exactly what the Deleted City exhibition is all about. And his studio also initiates research projects and works with clients to produce works that bridge both the social and technical areas of the digital realm. He has been incredibly cooperative and wonderful in working with us. And if you didn't get a chance to really manipulate the deleted city before this evening, I think you're going to really enjoy what Richard is about to show us, not only on the background of the piece itself, but how the deleted city actually works. He's here tonight from the Netherlands. Please join me in welcoming Richard Vigen. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for hosting the event and inviting me. Uh, to come from the Netherlands uh, to this evening. And I also want to thank the museum for uh, exhibiting the deleted city uh, here uh, for the last few months. And I think ultimately it's, it's the best and most fitting place uh, for this work to be shown. So when I released this project, uh, and this was in 2011, so it's already five years ago, I called it a digital archaeology. But I became interested in GeoCities not as a historian or an archaeologist or even a programmer, but as a graphic designer. And since I started my, my studio in, in 2009, I've been interested in, in this question. What does data look like? As a graphic designer, I was trained to, to visualize information and, and structure it into books and prints. 
But after finishing art school, I quickly realized that the information that I had learned to work with was changing fast. And for one, it's growing. And I always like to show this, this quote from an IBM study from a few years ago um, that illustrates that. It says that 90% of all the world's data has been created in the last two years. And it's kind of abstract to really grasp um, what that means, so I'll just leave it up here for a bit. Um, but for me, it illustrates the astronomical growth in our ability to gather, store, and process information. So if this is the future of information, what does that mean for information design? And will graphic design even be relevant in a world where stories and ideas are no longer just in a manuscript, but in terabytes of data? So my first strategy to deal with this, with this growing scale of information was to investigate algorithmic design, where instead of designing images, I started to design software that translates data into images. So it's not just the scale of information that is changing my practice as a designer. Information is also becoming more and more abstract. So traditionally, we are used to thinking about information as the medium that holds it that it has a location that you can point at. So we think of a book as a collection of paper, music or as a CD or vinyl, and even in the digital age, a file used to be in a folder on a hard drive or a disk, and every web page still has quite literally an address that you can type in to get to that information. But increasingly, I think uh, these carriers, uh, addresses and locations are disappearing from our site. And the medium is becoming transparent in a way. Today, when I get a Facebook notification on my phone, I couldn't say where that information is, where it came from, and how it got to me. It's just there when you need it, but otherwise invisible. Information has become, as it, as it is often metaphorically described, a cloud. And this image is uh, an artwork from the Japanese architect and artist Tetsuo Kondo uh, that was at the Center for Art and Media in uh, Karlsruhe, Germany this year uh, that I think kind of nicely tries to uh, rematerialize that concept. Um, so as a user, I think this is, this is great. Um, but as a graphic designer, I wonder, how can I understand something that I cannot see? And how can I relate to what I cannot understand? So today, many of my projects use visualization as a way to translate the abstractions of digital media into something that we can see and discuss. Like, for example, this application that visualizes several global databases to show the actual cell towers, Wi-Fi routers, and satellites around you. It reveals the invisible information infrastructure that surrounds us 24 hours a day. Or this visualization in Times Square, New York, that shows the invisible changes in groundwater reserves around the world. It is with projects like these that a data set become, can become a story or a starting point for a new discussion about something that is otherwise quite abstract and invisible. So in 2011, I came across another data set that I thought contained a story. It was a backup of GeoCities. And I was particularly interested in this because GeoCities was actually one of my first experiences of the web in the mid-1990s. And around that time, there was a lot of talk about this new thing called the web. Uh, but this, despite all the enthusiasm, no one seemed to really be able to explain to me what it really was. So instead, I remember a lot of metaphors that were used to describe this new phenomenon. Some said it was an information highway or a global library or even a completely parallel universe, a cyberspace or a digital city. And I was, of course, super excited. So I, I got a modem and I signed up for eWorld, which was an online service from Apple at the time um, that also used the city as a metaphor for the internet and also for this interface. This was a screenshot from the CD-ROM that you got um, when you started using the service, and you can see that they portray the internet as a city with, with buildings representing various functions of the internet, and apparently also some public space where people seem to be hanging out and um, meeting. So from eWorld, I eventually moved on to the Digitale Stad, which is a Dutch 
um, digital city at the time in the 1990s, a digital version of Amsterdam, where users would have home pages in areas that matched uh, neighborhoods in the city, like the Museum Square or the Red Light District, very important. Um, and I quickly discovered that what the Digitale Stadt or the digital city did for Amsterdam, GeoCities was doing on a global scale. Now, the metaphor of the internet as a city was very powerful. It helped many people understand and relate to a new medium. But GeoCities also used it as a way to structure content and invite people to add new content to it. So instead of the virtual city matching the real city one-to-one, -one, it matches neighborhoods to specific content. So for example, there's a neighborhood that was called Athens for history or Hollywood for film, et cetera. The users of GeoCities were called homesteaders, a reference to the Homesteading Act of the 19th century that was aimed at populating an empty continent, or at least in the minds of those who were populating it was empty, that you could get a free piece of land if you managed to stay on it and survive for a couple of years. And just like their predecessors, the homesteaders of the World Wide Web were encouraged to populate the emptiness of cyberspace with information. So before becoming a homesteader, you had to decide what your homepage would be about. Based on the subject, you would choose a neighborhood, Paris for romance, Nashville for country music, and you would apply for a free piece of land, or the equivalent of five megabytes of web space, to settle down and build your own homepage. Although GeoCities could help you with your homepage, for me and for many others, the joy in, was in building one using HTML. Because there was no fixed idea of what that homepage should look like, you would see a kind of digital folk culture of people collectively developing a kind of grassroots digital vocabulary. And a great example of this, I think, is the under construction GIF. <laughs> so this started probably as an apology from some ambitious netizen for a half-built homepage. The thousands of variations created by users came to epitomize the DIY culture of the early web. In 1999, GeoCities was the most visited website on the planet. The third most visited, I'm sorry. And it was bought by Yahoo. But at the turn of the century, things changed. The dot-com bubble burst, the internet wasn't new anymore, and we didn't need the metaphor of the city anymore to understand it. So with this new face in the public adoption of the technology came new metaphors, such as the internet as a social network. And the homesteaders of the digital city left their homepages to become modern users of Friendster, MySpace, and later Facebook. And Yahoo eventually ended up with a digital ghost town. In 2009, they decided to pull the plug and put up a 30-day notice that they would delete GeoCities. And at the time, GeoCities had lost a lot of its glamour. Many considered it to be a relic of an obsolete version of the web. But the archive team, led by Jason Scott, saw something valuable. Despite its dated aesthetics and lack of web 2.0 interactivity, GeoCities contained the collaborative work of millions of people, sources to about 100,000 Wikipedia entries, and a testament to early internet culture and the 1990s in general. They saw digital heritage and decided to make a backup. The result of their effort was this 640 gigabyte BitTorrent file that I found in 2010. It took me about six months to download. <laughs> And here you can see the dramatic moment where it was stuck at 80.1% for about a month. <laughs> so after I downloaded it, it took about a week to unzip. And after that was completed, I had on my desk a two terabyte disk that contained what was once the most popular community on the web. Like a digital Pompeii, a city frozen in time. Fascinating, but pointless. <laughs> a disk filled to the brink with compressed files and file structures, meaningful only to engineers and researchers. So I wanted to try and use my skills as a designer to translate the technical structure of the backup into a visual form that would be accessible to a broader audience. 
and I made many small programs to test different visualization approaches. And since I had always been a little bit disappointed that the virtual cities of the 1990s didn't actually look like cities, I figured that now that it was up to me, a city map would make sense. It allows you to see the neighborhoods in relation to each other, and it gives a sense of orientation. Zooming in and out to get an overview of the whole structure, and zooming in to see the individual HTML pages, animated GIFs, and hear the many MIDI music files that are embedded in the pages. So you can play with, your, uh, you can play with it uh, in the exhibition later, uh, but to give you an idea what it looks like, uh, this is a short video that shows it in action. The soundtrack is a MIDI file that I found somewhere in the archive. So after putting the video online in 2011, it was covered widely in the press and people started discussing digital history, how the web had changed in those just 15 years. Archaeologists were arguing whether or not this was archaeology, and copyright lawyers were discussing the legal implications of the archive. The torrent and the visualization, and to me, that was exactly the point. Translating the technical structure of the data set into a form that starts new conversations about digital history. And the question that remains for me is if we can learn from it. As one of the first massive global communities on the web, GeoCities was also the first to be abandoned after a great period of success. And in the end, the archive team was there to save the digital lives of millions of netizens. But I think today, the stakes are much higher. The web is not just for enthusiasts anymore. If the social networks of today are ever replaced by new metaphors, let's hope there's an archive team to rescue them. This time, I'm not sure if I'll be able to visualize it, because the backup of Facebook is probably not going to fit on my hard drive. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard, thank you so much. That was terrific. <clears throat> and now we're going to meet the entrepreneur behind all of that, David Bennett. David Bennett was a social networking pioneer before the phrase social networking was even known. Uh, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg were in elementary school when David Bennett was first considering how to make the web a truly two-way, very broadly distributed 
and creative medium where people could actually meet people and form communities. And as you can see, GeoCities was an incredibly successful undertaking, so much so that Yahoo did what it did uh, in 1999. But since then, I think it's also important to know that David has uh, not only continued to pioneer in technology as an investor, he sits on the board of a number of technology companies around the country, but he's also really continued to pursue the social conscience that drove him to create GeoCities in the first place. Uh, first of all, he serves on some of the most prestigious boards in the country, uh, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, he's the chairman of the board of the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts. He's the vice chairman of the board of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Association. So he's very deeply involved in the artistic life of the country through those undertakings. And the foundation, the David Bennett Foundation that he went on to found as the result of his work with GeoCities uh, has supported some of the boldest and best public undertakings in the country, especially in the area of LGBT-related causes. Uh, his philanthropy includes the establishment, just to show you how he's continued to match uh, all of these interests and passions of his. Uh, he's continued to fund things like the David Bennett Cyber Centers, which are currently uh, at over 60 sites nationwide, which offer business, educational, research, and recreational opportunities to the gay and lesbian communities in their local areas. And he also is very involved in the life of higher education in this country through uh, his service to his alma mater, USC, and uh, to his, uh, his uh, graduate school home at the University of Michigan. He's based in Los Angeles, uh, and he is uh, a collector on top of everything else. He's got a vast collection of really fascinating uh, physical archives uh, and, and um, artifacts from throughout uh, computing and telecommunications. And I knew David would be a, a kindred spirit with the museum when I first saw his office in Los Angeles and saw this wall of artifacts that he had that looked very much like the Computer History Museum. We've been hoping to get him here for a very long time and he's here tonight to tell us about all of this. Please join me in welcoming David Bennett. Thank you, John. That was so very nice. great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we had a pretty good time walking through Revolution did. earlier, didn't we? We did. The museum is, is just incredibly impressive, and you have built uh, a series of exhibits that really bring to life the history of computing and computing technology, and you've done a magnificent job in terms of putting it in context to uh, the impact that this technology has had on society. It's just really terrific. That's great, David. Thanks. Well, it's so good to have you here. Did, does it take you back uh, when you see those images? Oh, I mean, Richard has, has done a terrific job on any number of levels in terms of capturing the essence and the, and the context of what GeoCities was all about. It's, uh, I started to read about Richard's work as, as it was initially publicized and just reached out to him and said, I want to help support this. I, I think it's, it's important. I think the way you have contextualized and conceptualized the material is, is very unique, and I'm pleased that we've had a similar uh, uh, exhibit at LACMA, the County Art Museum in Los Angeles, and Deleted Cities has been the Barbican in London and, and has had quite a life, so thank you, Richard. <clears throat> we like to get to know our guests when they come, uh, so can we take you back a bit to your roots? Every time that a pioneer like you comes to the museum, we like to find out how did you get interested in computing to begin with? And so what sort of said to you, you know, this is not only an interest of mine, but I might really have some aptitude for it. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in a suburb of uh, Chicago called Hinsdale, Illinois. And I would go to the Museum of Science and, in and Industry in Chicago and, and would really beg my parents and grandparents to take me there uh, because I was so fascinated by the exhibits, including a very, very prominent and significant Bell Telephone exhibit in the 60s. And so it, was, it really sparked my passion and creativity and inspiration in, I was fascinated by the communication technology, mm -hmm. uh, including telephones. And Hinsdale happened to have this big switch, the big regional telephone switch, and it was a testbed for 
the early touch tone uh, service. And I, again, I've said to my, I'll spend my allowance money to get a touch tone telephone. And, and then I became a ham radio operator uh, and built, built Heath Kits and ham radio. And so I've always had this passion for communication technology since a very, very early age. And did you like to tinker with it too? Did you? I did. I mean, I loved, I, I, I liked both the, the, the electronic and the mechanical part as well as the ability to, for, for people to communicate with each other. So it was, it was both. Now, I was fascinated to learn that you specifically picked USC as a place that you wanted to go in part because it had a computer science program, and this was 1974. So what was that all about? Well, I was going through the college catalogs, and I was fortunate in high school to, to learn basic programming on a uh, uh, teletype time sharing on, on punch tape. So I learned basic in high school and thought I was interested in pursuing computer science and looking at the college catalogs. USC had an early computer science program, and I did, I did enroll at USC as a freshman and started in computer science and computer programming and was in a number of programming courses. But then I realized, and I guess I didn't know this at the beginning, that to get a degree at that time in computer science, you had to get a math degree because it was really mostly focused on the theory of computing. And I was interested in more was the, the theory of computing technology and, and, and computer structure. And I was much more interested in the application side. And so uh, I took a number of programming courses at USC, but then switched and became a, a business major. Mm. So we, software was a passion for you from Still the is. early stage. Still is. I mean, just, just right from the very beginning. And I'm, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, going through the uh, exhibit, there's this great uh, uh, app now. There's a number of object-oriented apps on your phone, but there's this great app called the Tomorrow Corporation. I don't know if anybody's seen it or used it. And it teaches you object-oriented pro programming on your telephone, uh, on your iPhone. And uh, I, I still program today. Now, you also said you worked for what was then called Arthur Anderson. We now I, uh, Accenture, my first and... job out of graduate school was with Anderson Consulting, which ultimately became uh, Accenture. And at that point, to, to go through the, the training program for Anderson Consulting, you had to learn uh, assembly language programming. And I would go to a Arthur Anderson training facility outside of Chicago, and you couldn't leave until you had completed a successful uh, uh, program on, on a payroll system in assembly language. And uh, started my career then doing uh, computer doing consulting for mainly financial reporting, general ledger systems, uh, management information systems with Anderson Consulting. So you're, you're here tonight. That must mean you got to leave. I, and, I didn't. I know. loved it. I mean, I, 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 learning assembly language was really, the, to me, learning the fundamentals of how computing operates. I want to skip forward a little bit now to, to the, the period of time when the, the web exists. It's pretty nascent. Uh, and you start to think about these, th this idea that people ought to be able to connect with each other through this technology. How, what struck you about that and, and what caused you to really pursue that? I was fascinated when PCs first came out from a business application standpoint with, with word processors and spreadsheets. But once you could connect a modem to a PC, for me, the entire world changed because then you had the ability to connect this amazing machine to an outside world. So I was uh, always connecting to proprietary BBSs and bulletin board systems right as soon as those were available. And then when the online services came about, Prodigy, AOL, and CompuServe, that then opened up an even wider realm for me of communicating with people of similar interest. And so GeoCities was really just an extension of that moment when we all could, could turn on a modem and, and, and connect online with someone. And when the internet first came about in, a, uh, in the early 90s as a, as a possible uh, commercial medium, I thought this has the potential of being global online service. And, and that's how it started. You, you described at one point this epiphany that you had on a plane when you first read about the web. Was that it? I was uh, uh, riding back from a, actually a, a, a memorial funeral service in Boston. And I, I read about the World Wide Web, and from that moment, I just, I just couldn't sleep. I mean, I knew I really was, I just had to be a part of this. Uh, 
Did you see it as a business opportunity as well? I had had um, significant experience in software and tech starting with my, my job at Anderson Consulting and worked for a variety of software companies uh, along the way, including uh, Central Software, Goal Systems, Legion, uh, and then that be became Computer Associates. So my career had been in uh, software and tech and and in various business-related jobs. So I, 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 this was way, way, way before the commercialization of the internet, so I didn't know what form the business models would take, but I knew that there was tremendous potential, and I knew that if you built an audience, that ultimately the business models would would follow, mm. but there was no, there were no banner ads. There, there was, I mean, there was nothing. Yeah. But, but I thought, let's build an audience and, and go from there. Now that sounds a lot like Mark Zuckerberg, or maybe he got that from you. <laughs> In terms of, that's what he said about Facebook. We're going to build a, we're going to build right. a community, and then we're going to figure out whether the, it can be monetized. Right. And I think having my, having had my experience in, in business school and my career in business, I knew that if you could create a brand, and if you could create a consumer connection to that brand, that, was, that would be very powerful. Now, it, it didn't start out as GeoCities, did it? Was that? It started out as an ISP. Uh, I, I called the unfortunate name Beverly Hills Internet. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was living in Beverly Hills, and I thought, well, that's catchy. Uh, but, Sounds pretty, you know, pretty up there. It's, yeah, uh, and, but so we had a number of uh, early web hosting clients, and that's how we cut our teeth in terms of learning the, the actual fundamentals and the technology was, was bringing on a number of clients with uh, early, very early web hosting services. Uh, and then the GeoCities part of that evolved out of what you were learning as I was an fascinated by webcams, and I still am. And I'll never forget when I saw people here might remember the, the Cambridge coffee pot, which was you know, one of the very, very first webcams. I thought that was the most, the most amazing thing. And it was these engineers in Cambridge that, that rigged up a webcam on the coffee pot downstairs because they didn't want to get up from their desk to see if there was coffee. So they created this webcam. And it, to me, it just created this whole sense of awareness that, that we hadn't had before. And so I, I thought, you know, we're doing this web hosting, and it's OK, but I'm, I'm really, really fascinated by these, by these webcams. And so I had a friend that had an office, a graphic design office at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. And I said, can I put this, I don't know what you think we call it, can I put this video camera in your window? He said, yeah, what's this all about? So we bought Sun Spark stations, and there were no, there were no, web, there were no webcams, and we had a Sun Spark station and an interface card and a camcorder. And so we soldered the camcorder output to the interface card and wrote the software to refresh the image every eight seconds. And uh, it became this... You know, there wasn't that much going on at the time. It became this big hit that there's this, you could go to this, you could, first of all, you could see Hollywood and Vine on the web live every eight seconds, and then you could go and sit on the bench and wave to your, to your friends. And then when we got an office in Beverly Hills, we had this kind of angled version of, of Wilshire Boulevard and did our second webcam there. And these generated a lot of traffic because they were, they were very, very new at the time. And uh, that was what led to the initial burst of traffic, and then when I came up to a trade show here in uh, San Jose, actually, and I drove up with my booth, and I was setting <laughs> up the booth, and Jerry and David were setting up their booth for Yahoo at the same time. Uh, this was for the ISP side of the business. I was driving back, and I thought, what do we do to take advantage of this traffic that's generated by these webcams and create something that's sustainable and enduring, and that's when the idea for, for giving away web pages came about. Mm -hmm. Now, you were telling me earlier, you wrote the HTML for... So I thought, OK, cities. what we're going to do is we're going to give away free web pages, which wasn't a particularly unique idea. Other, other, you could go to other places and pretty much set up a web page. But it was creating the context and the metaphor that Richard so aptly described, which is creating a context for people's contribution and participation. So using the webcams as an inspiration for place names, so Hollywood for Entertainment and Wall Street and Rodeo Drive, it was kind of merging that, 
that, that concept of, we'll borrow on the brand equity of these well-known place names to create themes for the communities. And that came from, this, from the webcam work. And that was the thing that was unique, as, as Richard had described, so that people actually had to go through and, and, and pick, well, what's my page going to be about? What, what am I interested in? And actually pick a, pick a spot where they're going to build their site about their particular passion. And that's, that's really how it started. What was it like watching those first pages go live? Well, I had an office uh, uh, with small offices, me and co-founder John Resner. I, uh, I founded the company and then brought John on. He was a, a programmer and systems programmer uh, working for Litton Industries, and he became my co-founder and built the infrastructure for, for GeoCities. But I had a web uh, client that uh, would ding every time I got an email. And so, you know, I'd sit at my desk and, and we'd hear a ding every 10 or 15 minutes about some of the ISP business or whatever. And then once we launched GeoCities, I think I sent an email to, you know, 13, 20, 15 people saying I've started this, you know, site to grip, set up your own free homepage. It got to be that I had to turn the digging off. It was constant all day long to the point where at our peak, and we would have statistics, we were signing up new users at the range of about eight a second, you know, and that was, it was amazing to see that. Eight, eight, eight new users every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Was, there, was that the moment when you knew you were onto something, or was yeah. it earlier than yeah. that? No, I, it, uh... I, when, well, once I started people creating their pages, and, and I'll get back to the HTML uh, question, I knew we were onto something when I, when I started to see how much effort and passion people were putting into creating their sites. But when, so when we first launched, it was still all dial-up. And primarily, people were getting online through AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy. And I wrote the HTML. There were no HTML editors. So I wrote the native HTML for each of those uh, particular services. So they each had unique characteristics in terms of how they would uh, access and get onto the web. And I'm responsible, I think, for some of those under construction or whatever gifts that <laughs> showed up. And, uh, uh, and learned native HTML and, and wrote the initial templates because it was important to give people a way to, it, it was formatted at that point. And then very early on, we allowed people to embed their own uh, HTML and create their own custom page. And was it really easy? For me, or it was easy. I mean, it was, it's, it, it's, an, it's an easy markup language. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of people, I've, I've heard from many people over the years that they, they learned how to program through learning HTML when they were on, on GeoCities. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, that was their first programming experience is when they built their GeoCities page. And, and where, where did it take off first geographically? Can you sort of mark the, the initial phase and then how GeoCities grew? And well, there were six communities initially, and then we con continued to subsequently add communities until there were I'm not sure how many there were, and there were sub-communities among them, but 35 or 40 major topic areas as it, as it grew. It was always based in, the company was based in Southern California, although we had huge, uh, huge data center up here. Who were the, the um, who was driving the most traffic uh, in the beginning? Entertainment. You know, yeah. people are always interested in, in creating fan pages and pages about, and then sports. So it was really entertainment and sports were the two, uh, uh, primary communities. And there was a, there was a and you might, you might get to this, but in, in, in my mind, I saw the internet, I, I, there, there to me was going to be a grand battle. Would, would it be programmed from the top down, or would it, be, would it be created from the bottom up? And it was my passion to legitimize and provide the forum for user-generated content. And I thought that all of us are the ones that have very interesting content and stories and experience to share, rather than it become from the beginning a top-down program medium. And there was a grand battle with with investors and others to uh, uh, celebrate and showcase the the creativity of user-generated content. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first the first? original user sites that you saw that made you think, wow, uh, now I can see that this is really going to, this is going to create something new as a new medium, not just simply provide a forum. 
Yeah, I think I was, I was struck at the very beginning by the diversity of, of the, the creativity and the diversity of, of things people were interested in creating. So we were adding communities uh, 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 very, very quickly. But there was some sports pages. There were some finance pages. Um, and I, I, you just couldn't keep up. And you, it's still, I don't, I don't think, no one had ever seen the entire thing because it, it just got too big too fast. Yeah. How quickly did it grow, just in volume of, of pages? Well, we started clients. in uh, 94, and we went public in 98. So it was a very, very rapid four-year trajectory, and, and it was still growing very fast and very rapidly at the time we were acquired and went public. What did the, the business model part of it turn out to be, David? Advertising and, and e-commerce. Uh, we, were, we were able to pitch the fact, and this was, this was in fact the case, that we had audiences defined by content area, and so advertisers are looking to reach targeted audiences. And so we could automobile companies, we could get finance companies, we could get apparel companies, we could get, uh, but no one, I mean, the very first, the very first banner ad I saw was, was for Volvo, and that was probably six or eight months even after we launched. So it was, you really had to convince advertisers to experiment with, with the new medium, and, and it, now it, it's become such, you know, a, a dominant one. But um, it was advertising, and then it became e-commerce uh, in the very beginning days of it. Was there a dot-com scene in L.A.? Was it, were there other? No. And, and I was, at the time, I was always glad to have kind of created the, the company in Southern California. There was a wide variety of talent available. There wasn't as much competition, and but there was also also bigger challenges. The funding sources were fewer and, and farther between, but we could kind of do our own thing, you know, under the radar and not really be part of uh, what was going on up here, which was also really great. And that's interesting. You found that to be an advantage. I did, and I and I, I had a lot of connections in Southern California, and, and and I still do. Yeah, yeah. And and now, so to follow on with your question. Now, and it's taken all this time, there is a tremendous ecosystem and infrastructure of technology companies in Southern California, but it's taken really these, these last two decades to build up to what such a critical mass it is today. Did you go through all the trials that dot-com startups in those days went through? Just, I mean, growth alone must have caused you some real business headaches. Well, the two, the, 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 the two biggest trials were raising money, and I had bootstarted the company with, with my own funds and knocked on 50 doors and got 50 no's. No one really got it. I mean, no one in, in, until uh, early VC came along and, and through a, what I call the woeful tale of dilution, you know, I sold a significant chunk of the company for enough money to keep us going, and then we raised subsequent rounds of capital. So it was, it was fundraising, but then it was a tremendous, tremendous technical challenge to keep up with the growth. And there's a classic scene in the social network where the founder of Facebook is standing around the pool with a portable phone in his hand, and he's going ballistic that the site it was either down or slow. And uh, I could completely relate to that, because to me, we were giving away a product for free, and the, we had a great responsibility. I felt we had a great responsibility to the users who were creating the content to make sure it was easy and it was fast and it was reliable. And I think that was one of our greatest strengths is that when you, when you got to GeoCities, there were times when it was slow, but it was pretty much, you know, the, the performance was really fast. And that was the biggest challenge because we had to build everything from scratch. There, were, there was no there, there's no infrastructure for the web, so we had to build out all of our server farms and all of our back-end applications and all of our tools we had to build from scratch because none of this, none of this existed. And fortunately, we had an engineering team that could, could do that you know, and keep up, but that was a huge challenge. The legendary nature of going public in the mid to late 90s is <clears throat> well known here in Silicon Valley. And I just wonder what it was like for you to take such a hot company at the time through that whole process. Can you describe what that was like? First of all, did you want to take it public? Was that just the natural way for, for, the, for it to evolve? It was a, 
I mean, it was inevitable that there would be some form of exit because of the amount of venture capital we had raised. And How much had you raised by that point? Uh, $130 million. Wow. And that you know, investors were, would, would look for some exit at, at some point. And I founded the company and brought John Reznor on. And then I ran GeoCities as the CEO until six months before we went public. And I remember a, 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 a walk I had with one, that very first investor. And we're, I call it a long walk off the short plank. And, and he was saying, you know, uh, long story short, maybe it's time for you to consider stepping down. And I thought, you know, I think that's a good idea because my background was in software and tech, and we were developing a business based on media and e-commerce, and we were able to attract a very, very significant uh, uh, Madison Avenue media executive, a publisher of uh, US News and World Report, uh, Tom Evans, to come in as the CEO six months before we went public. And I helped uh, uh, interview and recruit for the CEO. And, that experience was very, very beneficial for me in my subsequent career in counseling other entrepreneurs about when is it time? You know, what's, what's, what's in your best interest and what's in the best interest of the company? So I, I was CEO until six months before we went public, then I be, remained chairman. Uh, Tom uh, came in, did a fantastic job establishing the business side, the credibility side of the business, and uh, was instrumental in, in in, in our credibility and in, in going public. And I thought once, once we went public, that was gonna be our future. And then we were subsequently acquired six months after that. But it was, a, it was thrilling. Uh, how did the transaction with Yahoo come about? We had, and this is something that I was very deliberate about, we had a, a, a diversity of investors on our board and we had both uh, significant investors in Lycos and SoftBank, a significant investor in Yahoo. So we had investors at the time that had very competing interests in terms of, of their investments on the web. And ultimately, uh, through with, with relationships we have with SoftBank and my relationships and others with Yahoo, uh, we, we were acquired by Yahoo. Mm. Did you ever dream that uh, the purchase price would ultimately be $3.5 billion? No. No, I mean, who does? And, and uh, you know, I felt very uh, lucky and fortunate at the time, and I, and I still do. Yeah. Did you know David and Jerry well? Yeah. Not uh, well enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then, and then Tim, uh, who was uh, CEO at the time of the acquisition. What did you think after the sale to Yahoo? What did you think about Yahoo's approach to GeoCities and its vision for what it wanted to have happen after that? You know, to be to, to to be very frank, I was I was ready to move on to other opportunities and challenges. I was so grateful and fortunate to have been part of this and to have the financial resources to go off and do other things. That you know, I'm 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 a believe, and I was uh, uh, you know, I, I, when when GeoCities was acquired, I was older. I mean, not older than some entrepreneurs, so I was ready to go off and, and do other things and, and let Yahoo continue on with, with whatever they were going to do with it, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. Let me take a step back now just a bit from the GeoCity story itself and just ask you about the relationship that you see between your original theory behind GeoCities and what subsequently happened, you know, five, six, eight years later in the explosion of social networking generally. I, there are a couple of questions come to mind. First of all, why did it take so long? Because there was a, there was a gap of time between GeoCities purchase and the, the, the actual explosive growth of, say, MySpace and Facebook. And, and secondly, did you feel that they really, were they perfecting the model? Did they have a different vision of that GeoCities model? What would you say about that? Well, there was, as Richard mentioned, there was, you know, Friendster along the way. and, and you know, number, MySpace true. was, I mean, MySpace was huge. And it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that far off uh, from GeoCities. And, and what happened was, and it's a classic story that still plays itself out today, which is smaller companies that are laser focused on, on developing a niche or, or becoming, you know, very successful in a space can always outrun the bigger companies. And so that's what, that's the story of innovation. And that's what's so exciting about being 
you know, in this country and being in this, in this environment that we're in. And so I, it wasn't surprising to me that there were other companies that were going to out-innovate the, the, the GeoCities concept, and, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Um, the subsequent rise and, 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 and growth of social networks has been obviously quite phenomenal, phenomenal for all of us. And the, the one thing that, that is a disappointment to me in, the, in this entire scope of what's going on is, is GeoCities was about giving people the opportunity to share their passions about subject matter, whatever it was, whether it was sports or knitting or finance or watch collecting or fashion, that you had the forum, a very big forum, to share your knowledge and people would then find that. And, and now everything has become so, so self-referential. And that to me is something that I think that, that at least I, th I think we've, we've lost and I hope we get back, which is I, I never thought GeoCities was gonna be a celebration of the self. I thought and I intended it to be a celebration of what you have to contribute in terms of your knowledge base to the community. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure we're, you know, we're headed back to that, but that, that to me was what, what, what was so exciting about it. No, that's really fascinating. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I do want to ask you about the subsequent arc of the life of Yahoo as a company. Do you, based on your experience or maybe just your observation, do you have any, any perspective on what happened and perhaps why? Without commenting on Yahoo, because I really don't have any, any knowledge that the rest of us wouldn't, wouldn't already have, it's I remember uh, talking in front of groups and, and saying, you know, there will be something bigger than Yahoo. I mean, I remember way back saying, you know, when, when I was in the software business and was uh, uh, running a group of, of a, a company that had mainframe system software products, report distribution, online report viewing. You know, IBM, I, I mean, IBM was it. And, and no one thought there'd ever been anything bigger than IBM, you know? And then Microsoft was it. And nobody thought there'd ever been anything bigger than Microsoft. And then Yahoo was it. And now Google is it. And, you know, there's gonna be something bigger than Google. And there's gonna be something bigger than Facebook. As much as we don't believe it, this is just the, and this is the strength of, of our economy. This is the strength of our country. and. I knew, I wouldn't be, it didn't surprise me that there was going to be something bigger than Yahoo mm. and bigger than GeoCities. Mm. I'm going to ask you a, <clears throat> a couple of questions about your, your business interests, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about your, your philanthropic okay. interests. Um, from the business standpoint, what's the, what's the startup and, and technology scene in LA today? Because you're you're down there still in the middle of it, you're very active in it, and sometimes we up here in Northern California believe that Silicon Valley really is the center of everything, but there's a lot going on down there, isn't there? Well, the good thing is that there is, there is a, I think, a healthy convergence now of, of content and startup technology in Los Angeles. For, for the longest time, uh, Hollywood was this you know, kind of separate behemoth, and then there is this tech, you know, growing tech community. But now there is, there is a, a great intersection, I think, of, of both the content creators and the technology companies. And I think that's very healthy for uh, Southern California, uh, in particular in the Southern California tech community. And you mentioned that you, you learned a lot <laughs> and that you counsel young entrepreneurs. Uh, what, what kind of counsel do you give them based on your experience? I mean, a, a lot of it has to do with helping them find, you know, the, the, the right talent to, to grow their business, helping them stay focused on what their, their mission is, helping them at some point, if it's, if it's time to find an outside CEO, helping them that I've gone through that same path myself and why, uh, you know, as I say, it, might be in, it, it would be in their best interest or the best companies, the company's best interest. Um, is that a hard thing for them to hear? It's hard. Oh, it's hard for it was hard for me to hear. But it's hard for every entrepreneur to hear. Um, but but uh, there's a there's a history of that, and there's there's just very few, you know, very few Mark Zuckerberg's, Bill Gates, and Larry Ellison's in the world. There really yeah. are, and and there's people that are well suited to running certain companies at certain stages. <clears throat> 
Let's talk about a couple of, uh, we've got some really great questions from the audience, probably more than we're going to be able to get through, but let's, let's give it a shot. First of all, uh, this is from Bryce, an early homesteader on GeoCities. So we, we saw hey, Bryce. the cabin a minute ago. <laughs> How did you bootstrap the business before monetization? I imagine run costs were enormous. Can you describe uh, how you set that up and how you scaled it? I was fortunate that, that I had had, uh, I was 37 at the time that I started GeoCities, so I'd, I'd had some money saved up and, and uh, had resources to, to put into the company. But I remember we were, we were just running down to nothing. And, and I said to John, we went to lunch one day, and I said, John, we, just, we have to come up with a wind-down plan. I knocked on door after door of you know, any potential investor. We're not getting any interest. And we've given it our best shot. And we will always know that we tried. And, and you know, that was a really good lesson to, to, to kind of let go and know that not everything is going to be successful, but as long as you've tried your best and you put yourself out there, you know, and then lo and behold, a week later, the first investor came in. So that, to me, was a, you know, a lesson in doing your best, and if it's not going to work out, you know, be prepared to move on to the next thing. And as so often happens, then good things can happen from there. Did you have a, an idea in your mind of how long you were going to try to do that and let it run before you had to say, I'm going to have to move on here. Like just another couple of weeks. I mean, there was no, there just wasn't any more money. <laughs> <laughs> that close. Yeah. This is a great question. Uh, how, many, how many countries or languages was GeoCities? Oh, in? I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, there, I, I, would, I, I think at the time we went public, I would say there was close to between a quarter and a third of the traffic was international. So even for that point, it was a significant amount of uh, traffic that came from international. In terms of the number of countries, hard for me to say, but there was between a quarter and a third of the traffic that was international. And the biggest or the dominant ones? UK, Eng yeah. English-speaking countries. Yeah, yeah. It, how if... Canada. It, it's another homesteader here who wants to know, how could a GeoCities homesteader revisit the site or the, their website? Is there any possible way to do that? Well, I'm not sure we can search by specific address right now, but Richard and I are talking about a couple of extensions to deleted city. One would be an app where, in fact, you could access the archive on your phone and perhaps make it searchable as well, Yeah, which I think would be great. What was your reaction when you heard that GeoCities was going to be shut down? Well, it was almost 10 years exactly. And so I thought, you know, better it shut down than kind of go on as this, you know, abandoned version of its former self. I mean, better that we're here now talking about it and the way we're talking about it versus something that was maybe limping along, you know, and, and something that, you know, I wouldn't have been proud of continued to be associated with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a, a kind of philosophical question, and you touched on it a minute ago, uh, about whether GeoCities did prefigure the kind of user-generated content that we, we commonly think of as Web 2.0. Is that, uh, it, w was it predictive? Uh, how would you, how do you see it in that context? Well, you know, I, I appreciate people that have shared their experience that they've been on GeoCities, and I think it was predictive of what people would take away from it. And so uh, I, I told a story earlier today, I was in New York, a couple of years ago, and I was sitting outside, just sitting outside my apartment across from the Apple store on 59th and 5th, huge Apple store. And this, this guy came up to me and said, can I take your picture? And I was sitting just like this, and, and I said, sure. He took my picture. And then he said, what, was, what were among your proudest moments? And I said, well, it's, you know, in this city, one of my proudest moments was uh, I started an inter internet company called GeoCities and when it went public. And I was here uh, when, when the company went public on NASDAQ. And this gentleman uh, was the one and is the one that writes the popular Instagram uh, site, Humans of New York. And he wrote a segment about me on Humans of New York. And he started, he said, my first experience <clears throat> with the internet was GeoCities. And I wouldn't be here today 
doing what I do with humans in New York, which I think is really great, other than the experience you gave me on GeoCities. And I was hoping one day I could have you know, somewhat of a similar impact. And so I think that in terms of the user-generated content, it's more user-generated uh, experience that people took away either in programming or in content, content creation. Yeah. Are you surprised at all that it's become so media dominated today that the big media companies have really moved in and become, with a few exceptions, the really dominant brands in this whole space now? I guess not. Um, but there's, there's, it, it, it's really evolved in such a way that, that user-generated content is still such a dominant, I mean, look at YouTube. I mean, that, that's the epitome of, of yeah. where we've gone with user-generated user content, and a lot of it is really great. So, I, you know, I can be proud of that kind of trajectory and continuum. And at what point did moderating or, uh, or taking down content or being concerned about the, the need for censorship or some other way of looking at the content come up? That was a problem that I didn't anticipate and was a problem virtually from day one. And so, uh, and areas you, that you can imagine and areas you, you, you probably can't imagine. And so, um, and I thought, boy, this is this is gonna this can be a real problem, and it is a problem that that you know bedeviled and and it did in and continues to do in a number of, of sites that are unaware. And so, I thought the only way we can we can deal with this because of the scale of what this is going to become, is to develop tools for volunteer community monitors. And so that again created a sense of community and participation. So we would create very, very, very clear guidelines about what content was, was permissible. And you, I mean, it was extremely clear. And then we developed tools for community volunteers to take down content based upon those guidelines. And so, and then we had automated tools that would scan for certain types of content. But one of the reasons we're able to scale and scale to such rapid size without pornography and excessive violence was soliciting the participation. And these community volunteers loved it. I mean, there are a couple of people, of course, that went way off the ranch. But uh, <laughs> people liked it. They, they really liked saying, I'm going to keep my neighborhood friendly and, and, and clean. And, and our job was to develop the tools that allowed them to do that. But that was, that was a problem pretty much from, from day one. Mm -hmm. One more question about your, the business side, and then let's turn to your philanthropy. Uh, what sorts of investments uh, and advisory roles do you play now? And are, what are you really excited about when you think, look at the area of technology as someone who's experienced and, and also still investing? I mean, I, I really get excited about new consumer-facing applications. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll see, you know, I'll see new technology, I'll see, um, new new apps. So I'm I'm still more of a user interactive consumer technology kind of person that that <clears throat> makes makes life richer for for all of us. And also, uh, and this gets by into the philanthropic side, technology that helps empower individuals to be a part of their community. Technology that helps underserved communities. That's that's something that I'm also very passionate mm -hmm. about. Let's talk about that for a minute. You've, uh, your total uh, giving as a philanthropist now exceeds $100 million, and you turned to philanthropy almost immediately. Can you talk about why you did that and, and what has been your passion in this area? Well, I was fortunate to uh, grow up in a family where community service and, and, and giving back was part of the part of the community and part of the culture. So uh, I had been philanthropic, but had a, the opportunity to do it at a much larger scale after GeoCities. And it was really uh, uh, an expression and an extension of, GeoCities was about giving people the opportunity to be a, contribute and be part of a community. And I wanted to create that to a larger scale uh, within my own area, Southern California in particular, to help people feel that, that they have the opportunity to have a leg up in, in, in their community and in their environment. 
what, were there causes that attracted you initially that you really wanted to try to? There were there were several under the large uh, larger umbrella of social justice and and social justice causes. I've been a very uh, passionate and significant funder of anti-gun violence efforts right since the since the very beginning. Passionate funder of uh, civic engagement and voter participation from the beginning. Uh, mass transit initiatives and, and bike lanes, and very, uh, very long and very significant effort in marriage equality uh, from, from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Are you encouraged by what you see happening in those areas? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm encouraged by the progress, and I'm also discouraged by the lack of progress in some areas and, and, and discouraged by the current you know, polarization. But you know, overall, there are things that I'm encouraged about. Talk about the cyber centers a little bit, which I think are fascinating, and you're still continuing to open them all over the The, the cyber centers are, are computer labs, and so the cyber centers are, internet, are rooms within community centers where people can come in and get on the, get on the internet. And so there's 60 of them <clears throat> in uh, community centers around the country. There are some in university settings as well, uh, where they have between you know, a dozen and a couple dozen computers, and it's free, act, free internet access. And we'd all be surprised at the number of people who still don't have access to this technology in the internet. And so people use it for applying for a job, looking for an apartment, communicating with their family, and uh, they become very, very popular destinations. Mm -hmm. If you were giving advice to a young person who was just starting out in the technology field now, and, and you do advise a large number of them, what, what sorts of things would you say? Well, again, I was, I, I had had a couple of startup experiences before, but I was 37 when I started GeoCities, and I wasn't ready, I was barely ready then to start my own company. So I, my advice, and I lecture at business schools, my advice is, you know, get some really good experience with some, some, some bigger companies, or, or, you know, no, I don't think anybody comes out of business school prepared really to start their own, their own company, and so, you know, you, you get a job somewhere where you're really going to go through either a formal or an informal training program, learn from terrible bosses, learn from good bosses, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then, you know, start to think about what your, what your entrepreneurial ambitions are. Yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Well, it's been wonderful to have you here Thank tonight. You, and you've done such a tremendous job uh, in so many phases of your career. It's just really a pleasure to have you here tonight. That's an honor. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.